Um, good morning and welcome everybody. Let me just take a couple of uh, a minute or two as our waiting room fills into the full Zoom room before we get started. Sorry for the late start. All right, good morning. Uh, and welcome to this meeting on the committee, committee on the Revision of the Penal Code, which is now in session. I am Mike Romano, committee chair. Thanks to everyone for joining us today. Um, before we begin, uh, a few personnel announcements. Uh, I want to, first of all, welcome Professor, Professor Priscilla Ochen back to the committee. As many of you will remember, Professor Ochen was a member of the committee in 2021. She left the committee to serve as a special assistant attorney general for Attorney General Rob Bonta, but now that assignment is over, so I'm very happy that Governor Newsom reappointed her to the committee, and I look forward to working together again. Welcome. Thank you. Good to be back. I also want to say a word of welcome to, uh, on similar news, uh, I want to acknowledge that the uh, California Law Revision Commission, which provides administrative support to the P Penal Code Committee, has a new executive director, Sharon Riley, and we're excited to work with Sharon. I also want to note that her helpful predecessor, Brian Hebert, Herbert Hebert, how, uh, how important he really was um, to getting us started in our early days, how supportive he was to me personally. I don't think that anything that we do could be um, as smooth and helpful as without, without his um, support um, for years. And uh, we wish him all the best in retirement. Um, finally, uh, on some sadder news. This is the last committee uh, meeting with Justice Carlos Moreno. Justice Moreno has been a member of the committee from day one and has made invaluable contributions based on his experience at all levels of the judiciary. Um, I just want to say personally that I've deeply appreciated your insight, wisdom, friendship, and decades of service and dedication to justice, serving justice in California and beyond. Um, Carlos, we're going to miss you. Uh, the committee would just not be the same without you, and and um, we wish you all the best of the luck. Thank you, Michael, for those <clears throat> very uh, generous uh, comments. It's been a, a privilege and an honor to to serve on the on this commission and the very worthy issues that uh, we've uh, we've dealt with, and it's just amazing uh, that four years have passed, and uh, I'm so glad to have served the commission and and the governor and. and and look forward to this, uh, at least my fourth and final uh, uh, report. Well, well, thank you, huge shoes to fill. And as I uh, mentioned to Justice Moreno uh, on the phone before this hearing, I, no good deed goes unpunished. So he's promised to continue to be an unofficial resource to the uh, committee. Um, so um, th thank, thank you, I really appreciate it. Um, uh my, yes, I want to add, Justice Moreno, I just really want to express my appreciation because I have, um, you know, I obviously come in with a, a perspective of, from a policymaker, but I've mm -hmm. so valued your input and your direct experience in the roles that you've had. And I've learned a lot and I just really want to express my appreciation. Thanks, uh, Nancy. I've, I've always been really impressed with the detailed knowledge you have about the criminal justice system and your great efforts. and in trying to make the correct uh, reforms uh, to it. You're truly an amazing uh, legislator. Thank you. Hear, hear. All right. Um, with all that said, let's begin with a roll call of committee members in alphabetical order. Assembly Member Brian. Here. Justice Espinoza. Here. Justice Moreno. Here. Professor Ochin. Here. Senator Skinner. Here. All right, we're all here. Um, thank you all for joining. Today's meeting has three parts. First, uh, we'll discuss the draft of our annual report and recommendations and vote on whether to adopt the draft and based on any needed changes. Then we'll have a brief discussion on topics that we're intending to look forward into studying next year. Then we'll have a brief presentation from Tom on current violent crime statistics for 2023. And we'll also have public comment. So that's our agenda. Our first item uh, today is discussing the annual report and recommendation. However, before turning to that, we need to approve the minutes from our November meeting. Will someone please, uh, so I move to approve the minutes. Will somebody second that, please? Second. So I'll move. Uh, and Mike, I, I think you said November was the October meeting, obviously. Oh, excuse me. Just to, for the record. 
our most recent minutes. Uh, any opposed? All right. With that, I will take that those uh, minutes are approved. Um, so now, now is the, the the meat of our conversation today is to discuss the annual report, which was prepared by staff and circulated last week. We'll follow our usual process. We'll first to discuss the report and any potential changes among members and staff. We'll then hear public comment as we must before voting. Finally, we will address any final concerns or issues raised during public comment session and vote on whether or not to adopt the report and any noted changes. The report is an elaboration of the recommendations we studied over the course of the past year and discussed in summary form last month. As always, our recommendations are supported by empirical reports, analysis of similar reforms in other states, and original research conducted with the help with our partners at the California Policy Lab. We're still finalizing data and this draft and report will be put into final form by a graphic designer. The goal of today is to see if there are any changes that the committee wants to make with the understanding that I will have final decision over copy editing, adding citations, updating data and other non-substantive changes. As a reminder, and as detailed in the report, these recommendations are the culmination of the past year of this committee's work, including over 40 expert witnesses, hours of committee deliberation, public comment, and a tremendous amount of legal, historical, and empirical re research by our terrific staff. And I just want to thank uh, formally Tom, Joy, Rick. You guys have been amazing yet again. This is really a ton of work and uh, make us all look quite good. Um, and I and I think you know we've accomplished a lot. These are not just recommendations, but the legislature and governor have taken them seriously, and so much of our work has actually become law in California, and thanks largely to you guys. Um, with that said, I'm going to read off the 10 recommendations that are in the report, and then I'm going to ask um, anybody for on the committee if they have any questions, concerns, comments on any of the above. All right. Um, number one, support law enforcement assisted diversion, which is also known as LEAD. Number two, improve data access for the Racial Justice Act. Number three, create, create general resentencing procedures. Four, apply the nickel prior reform retroactively. Five, expand second look resentencing. Six, clarify that Senate Bill 81's updates, which were a previous recommendation from this committee, um, apply to strikes. Number seven, Focus welfare fraud prosecutions on the most serious cases. Eight, reduce the scope of criminal fines and add on charges. Nine, lessen unfair pressure to plead guilty. And number 10, use financial incentives to uh, reduce short prison stays. After reading those recommendations, which are all detailed in the draft report, does anyone have any questions, comments, or concerns? about those recommendations or anything in the draft that you'd like to further discuss as a group? Question, Mike. So you Sounds want to do it that way versus going through them individually? <clears throat> I would. We, we've discussed them individually over in the past. Of course, um, I'm happy to check through them, but I think that some of them we've you know hashed and rehashed, and I don't know if there's much more discussion. Of course, I, I don't want to leave anything unsaid. If people have concerns, I just want to kind of lay those out rather than Checking, clicking through each one. Yeah. Um, well, I think it would be worth it to, <clears throat> because so far I didn't really, couldn't tell in the draft, but I may have missed it by not reading really carefully. But um, for example, the LEAD program, um, I think that that can be done without any statutory change or even budgetary change, that that is really up to the locals. I think it might be worth it to differentiate in our recommendations, which of them would require an action um, in Sacramento versus local action? Sure. I, yes, many of these things I think can be done um, just at the discretion of police, prosecutors, um, sheriffs. Um, I don't think that we specify, Tom, um, that there should be any legislation, although the lead programs that we based our recommendation on was based on a pilot that was in the original, was in the budget. So I think it's mostly a budget item. And Tom, can you want to correct me if I'm wrong? 
Yes, that, well, as far as the historical, um, what happened with the pilot, that, that's right. There was a bill and then there was 50 million bucks in the in the budget that the BSCC um, administered for grants. Um, and I, I think, right, the locals can sort of do it now. You know, they could start tomorrow if they wanted to. But one of the things we heard from um, the witnesses we had was that it really is important to have a, a clear place in the penal code about what offenses are eligible, which ones aren't. And for better or for worse, that uh, there is a need for more money to do it, even though there's great arguments that it would save money if you sort of redirected some resources for it. So I think we wrote it up in a way that um, was sort of, you know, would require uh, legislative action for, for those reasons, but it's not. Except that when I read it, it re references that the localities would have the ability now to expand what, um, the category of uh, offenses. And I think, well, we don't have to modify the report, but I think from that respect, if we were to act legislatively, we might restrict it more than localities may choose. So well, I think that's, that's part of my uh, question too, Senator. Sure. I, it, based on remembering that meeting, it, it felt like the lead programs who were doing this um weren't sure that what they were doing was protected in the penal code that they that they truly had this that they weren't preempting some sort of so they wanted kind of clarity that they are allowed to do this um was my takeaway which you know I, I know there's a specific legislature who a legislator who's very interested in clarifying that they are allowed to do that if that is the concern but a lot less interested in the budgetary components um, or creating a specified list of offenses, because I think the senator is right that if the state enumerates any eligibility criteria, we will undoubtedly leave people out, and there may be jurisdictions that go further than that. And so maybe just codifying and clarifying that they're allowed to do this uh, to whatever extent they they would like to on you know any range of offenses, misdemeanor, felony, both, whatever, um, where they feel that it's appropriate. Um, I think that might be. Uh, the direction that we want to pursue, but curious, curious where we ultimately have landed. Well, I, I will say that that was absolutely the intent of, of what we wrote up was that just sort of you have to do at least these baseline offenses. And if you want to go further, you have the explicitly explicit authority in the penal code to do that. Um, so it might just be a we can wordsmith it. So that's a little bit clearer. But um, that I think we're we're already there. <laughs> is, is, is the uh, is the budget thought then in by saying you have to do these ones specifically, that's where they're going to say, well, to do that is going to cost us money instead of just opening it up to them being able to do this and the jurisdictions that have already set the kind of minimum threshold or that are already doing it. I guess I guess I'm trying to understand where the budget play is if we're just clarifying that this is allowed and, and Senator, yes. Uh, well, so apologies that I brought it up in terms of this first one, but... <laughs> Because if we look at the second one, for example, the Racial Data Act, it, is, it states clearly that legislation would be needed in order to get the additional data. Now, on this first one, um, I uh, I think it's we should not articulate or in the uh, document that we adopt that this could be um, that localities might not have the authority because if we do so then in effect, we are reinforcing that. Mm -hmm. And I think we, you know, we haven't asked the AG for an opinion. It could be that the AG's office says they do have the authority under existing penal code. So I, I'll, I, again, apologies for raising it around number one. I think number one- No, no, this is the beginning. This is, is, don't apologize, one, this is perfect. I yeah, agree. Number one is left to, uh, you know, it's an encouragement for localities. And of course, those of us who, you know, feel like there needs to be more, then obviously we can act, but it doesn't require additional budgetary action, though it might be helpful. So I think it is fine as drafted. And I think the less said about things such as whether there is this authority or not, because it has not been, to my knowledge, challenged, is better. That's a great perspective. Concur wholeheartedly. Yeah, if I could just respond to that, I think the, I don't think we were intending to suggest that localities don't have the authority. I think one of the witnesses brought it up. It was uh, Sheriff Diedrich from down there in uh, Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department who said that the police officers on the street who are making the arrest, 
sometimes have some question about whether after arresting a person, they'll be able to just release the person to a community-based service provider and that something in the penal code will give the officers that assurance that what they're doing is the right thing. So I don't think it was so much so that the, the, the locality had a question about the legality of it. It was more so the officers on the street, but I think we could clarify that more. I think that that's right. I think we're all on, this, on the same page here. We want to apply this as, as broadly as possible. We don't want to impose, need, excuse me, um, say that additional funding is required. We don't want to suggest that it's currently unlawful. We want to try to encourage this as much as we can. And I think that that's the way that the spirit of our report, and I think that both Assemblymember Bryan and Senator Skinner's, your comments are well taken and that we should just make sure that the recommendation has that uh, framing on it. And just yeah, yeah, finally, if the AG were to um, issue an opinion, it would that opinion would be distributed to law enforcement. Just of course, of course, of course. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Marino, did you have a question? Uh, not, not a question, just an observation, and mm -hmm. uh, particularly as to number seven and number eight. Okay, uh, I just want to well. Number seven is welfare prosecutions, uh, the most serious cases. Uh, I was particularly impressed with the work that we did there. Uh, that is probably an issue that lies more with the discretion of the DA. I don't think that requires any kind of legislation, but uh, those are cases that you know often troubled me when I was both on the municipal court and the superior court in terms of ability to pay. And I think ability to pay is really a threshold issue these days, not only with respect to bail, but other other types of uh, punishments. And then number eight, I think, does require, would require some kind of legislation. And, you know, the criminal fines and fees often are the, the tail wagging the dog. And I remember in, in, in sentencing uh, individuals to you know, mandatory fines. It was always astonishing as we saw how the the penalties, the uh, the fees and, and so forth uh, really, you know, multiplied the amount of the basic, basic fines. So uh, I think the courts would need, you know, clarification as to whether or not those, uh, those fees could be waived. So that's probably one where we would need some kind of legislation. But as to both seven and eight, I think those are both very worthy uh, recommendations. And I'm, I'm glad that the commission sort of extended its reach into these kind of consumer-oriented type uh, offenses <clears throat> where ability to pay is really a, a threshold, a very significant issue. So I just wanted to make those observations. I, I, I concur in that, and I'm very proud of our work in this area. I think that criminal law reform often gets captured by, um, you know, death penalty, uh, LWAP, three strikes, which we have all, you know, already participated in and made recommendations around. But in many ways, the, the impact, the day-to-day -day impact is in these cases that don't make the headlines. And these are explicitly related to people who are already, you know, struggling financially. And we want to obviously want to lift people up as much as possible and discourage crime, of course. Um, and um, I'm really glad that the more that we dig into the um, crimes and offenses and penalties that are sort of mass incarceration in a way that isn't necessarily thought of in, in the most obvious way, but in fact, millions of people in California. Oh. Are there other recommendations Questions, comments, thoughts people have. I just concur with the judge. This is a fantastic recommendation. All right. At risk of moving ahead too quickly, um, I want to just make flag because we did sort of have some conversation at our last meeting about the financial incentives, which is number 10. And I want to make sure that we understand that and um, feel comfortable with that. This would be um, to incentive to offer counties the opportunity, nothing is required, um, to be rewarded financially um, 
if they sent fewer people to state prison and housed and housed them locally as a um, way to make sure that nobody's gaming the system. We would want to make sure that sentences are not lengthened, that jail populations don't go up as a result, but that this is a truly de decarcerative um, recommendation. It's based on research that shows that people who have committed the same crimes with the same criminal histories actually have better public safety outcomes if they serve those sentences locally rather than in state prison. And it's an attempt to try to address the problem that the state has that so many people, um, most people going to state prison are there for very short periods of time. Um, so that is a long-term um, project I think that we need to continue to look at, but this is a, a beginning um, in that regard and is modeled after a couple of different incentive programs that the state has successfully implemented in the past. So I just wanted to make sure that we were all so square. Can you talk a little bit about the way, the mechanisms to make sure that jail populations wouldn't <clears throat> increase um, as a result of this proposal or, you know, what, what are, what are the, what are the experiences of other jurisdictions? As, as far as I know, and other jurisdictions haven't really had this pro haven't had this issue. And, you know, California has a special sort of relationship between state prisons and local jails, especially since realignment. Actually, the, probably the, the best, um, and Tom or Rick and Joy, please jump in if I'm wrong, the most analogous experience is realignment. Um, and this isn't, you know, a full realignment and it's more voluntary um, in that regard. Uh, realignment, as my understanding is, did see an initial increase in j local jail populations that that, stead that then steadily went down. I think that there's a way that could be drafted in legislation. I don't think that we as a committee need to be specific here, but to safeguard to make sure that, that jails don't just stuff more and more and more people in jails, especially jails like LA that are in so much trouble. Um, so we wouldn't want that to be the, the outcome. So you could imagine a way that um, they wouldn't get the incentive if their jail population went up as a result. Now, as a result, is very hard to measure. You know, does cr do crime rates go up, go down? Conviction rates go up or down? Sense so there have to be some subtleties built into that. But that would certainly be our intent. Tom, do you have thoughts? No, I, th I think that's it. I mean, some of the um, realignment didn't have sort of a a a a a, a a baseline built in where he said, um, where it com compared before and after, but things like SB 678, which was the incentives for um, around probation revocations to prison. And then the one the state just started um, recently around commitments to the state hospital, where, you know, we've got some good models if it ever gets to that need to have the detail of, you know, setting a baseline and, you know, adjusting it based on different factors. It, it would be complicated, but I think it's possible. And we've got some models for it already. One of the things that I've heard from folks that I've spoke to who have been in state facilities and county jails is the real disparity in programming mm -hmm. and other educational opportunities between jails and prisons. And I'm just wondering to what extent we're accounting for that difference. I mean, I'm I'm not I'm not advocating for or against the proposal, but these are just this is, know, this is what this, this is one of the big conundrums. Here's the deal: um, state prisons generally have better programming. They are not, these people are not getting them because they're in state prison for so short a period of time. We're talking about tens of thousands of people who go to state prison who just stay in reception center, do not get any program, are locked down for most of their time actually, and then are released to the county. I mean, Tom, do you have the figures on the top of your head how many people go to state prison for less than a year? It was about 14,000 people last year. Um, that's, so That's almost it's, half. It's almost half of all people admitted to state prison go, are in there for less than a year. They don't get the programming. Yes, the long-termers in state prison definitely have more exposure to programming than people at county jails. The other thing is that we found that I think is somewhat surprising is that even under the current system, um, the public safety outcomes of people staying locally in county jails, despite the lack of programming there, had lower recidivism rate than those same people who went to state prison, which sort of goes with the lack of programming. Now, there should absolutely be better programming, better conditions, better opportunities for people in county jails. I'm not saying that, but I'm just trying to say that they're not, if you're there, if you're in, we're not talking about the people who are being sent to state prison for 10, 20 years, right? 
we're talking about people who are going for a couple of months yeah. um, who are not going to get the programming in any event. Now, jail conditions are not good. Public safety outcomes are better. The idea is that people shouldn't be sent, be sent to state prison for so, such a short period of time. Those folks should serve their time locally and that jails should then put more people on probation in order to um, the people who shouldn't be in jail should instead be probation, again, which is a public safety benefit. So we're trying to give financial incentives to address a, a prison crowding problem, but also to address what we think is a better public safety outcome, sort of counterintuitively. That makes sense. This is, this is, this is a huge problem. 75%, is that right? 75% of less than three years? I think I think that's right. It's it's the majority do about eighteen months. Um, you know, once you account for pretrial and credits and all that stuff, of actually time spent physically at CDCR. I mean, seventy five percent less than three years is astounding. Yeah. And, the, and the prisons are not built for it. The prison system is not built for it, and and they're not getting the the improved programming that is associated with prisons for the most part. Yes, Justice Marina. Yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying, uh, Michael. It'd be, be nice in an ideal world, but it just made me recall, you know, just anecdotally, that when I sent someone to uh, to prison, <clears throat> not a first timer, but someone who had been there before, I remember my bailiff would tell me he just wants to get back to his regular life, you know, and and stability, and even for a, a hardcore. A uh, felon, county jail is is chaotic, <laughs> and they just simply wanted to to get out and go back to kind of a more regular life and probably uh, more training uh, programs, et cetera. And to me, that was kind of ironic. I always thought, wouldn't it be better to, you know, for family's perspective, everyone's perspective, to stay locally? But uh, those who had been to state prison before wanted to go back if they were going to be doing. A significant amount of time. So I certainly, think patients are right on point. Certainly, if they want to do a significant amount of time, that's true. If they're going to do a significant, that that's true. But it just goes to show how um, counterintuitive a lot of this incarceration yeah. is. That given how poor jail conditions happen to be, you still get better outcomes than if you're sent to state prison for you know mm -hmm. apples to apples comparison. Yeah. Senator Skinner. Um. It just occurred to me that if, if we are centered on the public safety outcome, that we might want to modify this so that we have more than just the option of a financial incentive. In other words, we could um, have a statute, for example, that said CDCR should not accept people with less than 12 months to serve. So in other words, that it is not based on the, the most of our, whether you go to county jail or prison is based on the offense. And so of course, if you're, the misdemeanors are in general in county jail. We have some higher offenses that end up only because of, they've been in jail a long time because of a variety of reasons, how long the trial took, any number of, any number of issues that then by the time they're supposed to serve, in the state prison have that less than a year. And then we find these outcomes. So what we um, might want to uh, stress is the fact that those regardless of crime who serve less than a year in state prison have far worse um, you know, public safety outcomes and that their time if they served it in jail would improve the safe public safety outcomes that that could justify just a policy that specified that those who had less than 12 months remaining would not serve it in state prison. Listen, I think that that's what the data definitely show. And I would defer to you, and I'm going to put, bounce it right back to you. I think that we had originally thought of, envisioned this as an incentive program, right. to avoid pushback from the county levels and say, you do it if you want to do it. Well, I like both recommendations because... Um, two reasons. One, financially, we may not be in a position to try to do those incentives, even though we know that the state would save money in terms of prison costs. But secondarily, if someone were 
there will be counties who feel they were unfairly targeted. Now, we don't um, show it so far in this report, but we I think we have shown in previous reports, there is a huge discrepancy in terms of the uh, percent of people that, so count, county by county, who gets sent to state prison and who doesn't. Um, we we have this broke, Tom, aren't we going to have that broken yeah. down by county? We yeah. did have that broken down in the past. Well, yeah. so, so, okay, maybe we'll have it shown here, but that will cause, I think, um, count, some counties, obviously, to feel un, uh, targeted, whether fairly or unfairly, which can cause, uh, you know, certain kinds of backlash. So, So I just to, to clarify, Senator Skinner, so when you say both recommendations, so you think that we should recommend an incentive program and on top of or that, you could say or and or or you could say there's two ways to approach this, something like that, or there may be others, but these are two that we've considered. You know, it, it um the sort of uh, the non incentive version, the uh, sort of CDCR closes the door um, idea, I think that's very similar to what the committee recommended in, in its first report in 2020. So we could. Um, you know, we have that work to refer to as well. And we can frame this maybe a little bit more as, you know, that's one approach. Here's another approach to the, the, the point is this is a big problem and we need to do better than the nothing that we're doing right now, I think. And, and again, I, rooted in the public safety. Act. Right. Yeah. I was precisely going to say it is a it is a big administrative problem for the state and CDCR. But more importantly, is if we can reduce crime by doing this, that's where we should be leaning into it. Agree. And I and I will say this is a conversation that we've been having with the governor's office and CDCR for years. They realize that this is a problem. This is a problem related to mostly, I think, or made largely uh, to politics between the state and county levels, uh, administrators, and, and so I think that this is solvable. Um, it's more of a political problem than anything else. But I, hopefully, we can help um, push the ball in the right direction here. Any other thoughts, comments, suggestions? No, I, I agree with with mostly uh, Senator Skinner's thoughts. I'm also just kind of curious, you know, thinking through the incentives, I guess that's the work of the budgetary and policy work later down the line. But are we actually saving how much, you know, I know we spend a hundred and some odd thousand per year per person incarcerated. I think we've also noticed in some of the prison closure work that it, it doesn't exactly translate those dollars per people when you still have incredibly high labor costs and other costs um, in terms of what the savings. So it's not like one person moved is a hundred and some odd thousand saved. And so I just want to make sure that we're mindful of that as we're thinking through the incentives for the counties as well. Yeah, no, of course that hundred, whatever thousand dollars, I think is in large part of fiction. Um, at the same time, um, were this to be implemented and certainly if it was a year cap, like a hard cap, the way that senators, I mean, that would be, real people, that would be almost half of the fewer number of people were, you know, sent to prison every year. It'd be substantial savings. The the precise number, I think, is, you know, above my pay grade, but. Uh, I, I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, too, for your work on this. There was a lot of conversation and feedback at the last meeting, and I was genuinely wondering how we were going to land, and it looks like we landed with a lot of, a lot of hard work and conversation by members of the group, so thank you for that. Yeah, you know, on on the cost part, real quick. Um, you know, these are the the your first days or weeks in a prisoner jail, the most expensive ones, especially when you go to state prison, because you have to be reevaluated again for mental health, medical care, all of which is extremely important. But if you're going to be there for you know a couple of months, it it's more expensive than someone who's going to be there longer. And transportation costs, which when we're talking about this many people, is not insignificant either. Um, so and if you're Sorry, and you're also at a higher security because every you have yet to be classified, so there's more staff per person. It's by far the most, except for the very old and very sick people, it is probably the most expensive population that we're talking about. So it's hard to say that what the average annual, you can't say the average annual prisoner cost to this person, this population. Um, all right, are there any thoughts, suggestions, comments on any of the other recommendations? We've been talking about these for months, so um, 
none of this should be new, except perhaps to Professor Ochin. In light of that, I have 82 more questions. Uh, let's see. Those Vogue videos. Um, all right. Thank, thank you all. This has been, you know, another um, amazing year. Um, and, um, you know, as, as you'll recognize, the report is really begins with each memo, each the research that staff does, you know, meeting after meeting, month after month, um, refined with the witness testimony that we have. And then, of course, all the data um, that we're able to collect and research along the way. So we'll take a final vote, including the glosses and amendments that we just discussed after hearing public comment toward the end of our meeting today. Um, but before we do that, Tom and I have a few administrative matters to, to cover. Um, the first is our agenda for 2024. Um, I want to discuss our plans with a bit, little bit of process and a little bit of substance. First, on the process front, changes to the bagley keen public meeting laws mean that we will most likely need to have a hybrid meetings next year where some committee members meet in person while others attend remotely via Zoom. Witnesses can still attend uh, remotely, which is uh, a great relief. Um, staff will work with each of you on these requirements. Because there will be more travel involved for some of us than in the past, we'll also work to schedule meetings further in advance to make things as convenient as possible. We hope to have our first meeting in February, but again, we'll be in touch. Next. We'll hear a very brief presentation from Tom about proposed substantive topics of study for the committee for 2024. As you'll hear from Tom, the focus in meetings is in the first half of the year. Our goal is to give staff directions for those meetings earlier in the year, and we'll fill in the, we'll fill in the second half of the year once we get into 2024. With that said, Tom, please take it away. I hope the rest of you can chime in with any suggestions or questions. Okay, so here's, um, you know, every year we, uh, me and, and Rick and Joy, the whole team, we, we you know, talk amongst ourselves and advocates and, and uh, legislators and stakeholders and a lot of people to try to get a sense of what topics might make sense. So this is what we've identified as um, some places to start next year for the Penal Code Committee. Um, and as Mike said, this isn't set in stone. It's not intended to be the full list, so we can add to it, subtract from it um, and, you know, in response to uh, how things go. So the first thing uh, we were thinking of, of looking at is DUIs, you know, drunk driving. This is um, sort of to Mike's point earlier, this is one of the, the most common things people are arrested and convicted of in the state. The public safety, the road safety implications are obviously enormous and affect, you know, everyone. Um, and it's a place actually where California has a lot of data and has made a lot of progress in the last few years. But we were thinking of looking at it and you know, seeing are we really maximizing uh, the public safety and the road safety responses to how, how we um, how the system reacts to these offenses. I will so, also let me just also add, you know, and perhaps the judges can chime in for a second. The laws and or and or Rick, the, the laws around drunk driving, there there are many of them. They are quite confusing, I think. Um, and it's it's a it's a thicket. I think that it's it's a ripe area for us to uh, wade into. So that's number one. Number two is accomplice liability, uh, particularly with the focus on ex extreme sentences um, uh, that many women are serving. Uh, so this is something I think that has come up in a lot of the committee's work, but um, how are, are people convicted um, of very serious offenses when they perhaps are not the actual uh, main perpetrator and other theories of liability? Um, it would be another way for us to come back to some of the longer extreme sentences in the system of the more particular focus. The third one is civil forfeiture, which um, you know I'm sure you all are familiar with, but it's this idea of taking money or other assets from people either before they're convicted of an offense or after. And we will look at how that process works on the front end. And then as well, I think on the back end of what happens to the money, how is it spent? And is it, it being spent in a way that really um, helps best preserve public safety and helps protect victims? Um, and the fourth one would be Factual innocence. So this is things, you know, or like how statements are taken from people, eyewitness identification, forensic, sort of those core of issues that, you know, there's been decades of, of research and litigation um, showing that, you know, many people are convicted based on the flawed way cases are put together. So we take a look at that 
and again, you know, California has done a lot of great work in this area and there's a lot of, a lot for us to build on. And then, you know, this is sort of what we're thinking of starting at this year. It's pretty full docket like this, but you know, there's, as it does every year, it'll adjust and change a little bit as we continue to, uh, to speak to folks and get feedback from you all as well. So any questions about those before I just basically repeat what Mike said about the schedule? <laughs> I mean, a few. Um, yeah. I think they're all fantastic. Uh, in fact, like, be willing to do work for another two months to get a few recos out of those <laughs> in time for next year. Um, they're, those are phenomenal topics. Um, one thing that, that's that been on my mind, um, thinking about it, uh, we've seen a lot of leaked tapes coming out of the LA County Jail and other places, and we've had conditions of confinement conversations before in this space. Um, you know, usually that centers around kind of solitary and the use of isolated confinement, but I think there might you know, be, be a need for a, a broader conversation about what's happening in these institutions and um, how that aligns with what should be happening and what kind of accountability mechanisms are there to ensure that um, they are not, you know, the places that we're seeing on on leak flash drives that find their way into trash. I mean, it's a it, it, it's pretty wild. And I don't know if that's necessarily for um, for this group, but it's something that I know is a is a hot topic and, and something we don't want to leave from the county jail space to end up being a state problem in prison somehow. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And certainly we've thought about conditions as being an appropriate uh, thing for the committee, but um, haven't quite dived into it directly. So just something to think about, uh, not not something to over, overly put weight on, but something that I think is you know, clearly being abused at the local level in terms of kind of the safety of these facilities um, and the, you know, the, the different opportunities for uh, increased harm are, are way too high and i don't know how to fully wrap my heads around my head around it but i, I think there's got to be some sort of space to to talk about whether the state has a role in that and i will also add of course that the legislature has passed now twice um a statute proposing a ban on solitary confinement or whatever the euphemism may be today yeah. uh, it's been vetoed twice so um I appreciate that this is an issue that's been important to the legislature in Sacramento. Uh, Professor Ochin? Yeah, I, I think these are great um, proposed topics. I would just add a couple of things that I think um, perhaps we should discuss if they haven't already been discussed by the committee um, uh, in the past. So one is uh, the availability of post-secondary education in um, California's uh, jails and, and prisons. Uh, Pell Grants have now been made available to uh, incarcerated students as of, I think, July 1st of this year. Um, I think California is doing pretty well in comparison to other states in this regard. Uh, you have a number of programs from the CSU to the UC to the community college, but I, my sense is that they're um, pretty ad hoc. Um, I know that there's been some budget support for these programs recently, but I, I wonder if it might be a good subject of discussion in terms of how we systematize uh, these programs uh, and make them effective and ensure that folks who participate in these programs are able to uh, maximally benefit from maximally benefit from them and ensure that there's you know mechanisms for reentry and transition if folks are leaving facilities to ensure that they can continue uh, their education um, so that's one. The other is, um, you know, I think I've talked to 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 you, Tom and Mike, about a bigger focus on um, women, the women's population in jails and prisons, and, and more generally. And so I think that um, there should be a conversation about reproductive rights and reproductive justice. Um, you know, to the extent that that's even a, I think it's a sort of a contradiction in terms, but I, I think we should think about how. Um, folks who are incarcerated in, in particularly women's jails and, and prisons are being treated as far as their reproductive care, reproductive choice. Um, there's been a number of state laws passed regulating this, this space, and I'm interested to see to what extent they're being followed. Um, in LA County, for example, the last year I was on the Civilian Oversight Commission for the Sheriff's Department. We were receiving reports that women, pregnant women, weren't getting you know adequate amounts of water and nutrition um, in addition to, you know, other kind of, you know, not, not sufficient exercise, just 
um, basic violations of um, you know human rights. And so I think that's I hope that's an area that we can explore and make recommendations. Um, and then related to that, uh, I'm interested in exploring the ways that families are impacted by criminalization and incarceration in ways that we can um, alleviate those burdens. Uh, so, you know, I'm not sure exactly how that would be phrased or to what extent the penal code is involved, but considerations for impact on family when, when fo folks are being sentenced, um, you know, that, that may be one thing that we can look at. I know there, there, there's a movement to try to alleviate that in terms of where folks are sent and so on, but I, I wonder if there's a conversation that we can provide some leadership uh, around. And then just lastly, I, I'd be interested in a presentation about implementation of important um, uh, reform proposals that have been enacted by the legislature that we've supported just to kind of get a sense of, of where they are and if there's additional, um, if there are additional recommendations that should be made. Um, I think that that's all very helpful and interesting. I, I guess I have some feedback and thoughts and then a question for the committee. Um, so taking your last um, suggestion first, we did, we have had some sort of um, I don't know if testimony is the right word, but has had some reports and data about um, our past reforms. And one of the recommendations in particular this year is that it, the to trying to create sort of a post um, conviction uh, resentencing procedure, uh, uniform procedures is in some ways a response to that. Also, the RJA uh, data request; those are all you know implement you know issues about implementing our current reforms. I. I agree that implementation is at least half the battle. So I think we need to definitely keep our eye on that ball as we move down the, um, the, the question about conditions and almost everything that you suggested, Professor Ochin and, and Assembly Member Brian, I think could fall under the umbrella of, of conditions. This is including women's health and families of people who are incarcerated um, and um, a lot of the problems. That, here, here's here's my question for a committee. I think that our, our, the, our um, um enabling legislation um when senator skinner do you want to jump in real quick well you, you can finish your thought and then i'll i guess my, my my ultimate question is is this an area that there are conditions generally an area that the committee should wade into our legislative direct directive is to improve the penal code i think it we could certainly say that the penal code should and can contemplate prison and jail con conditions in fact it'd be kind of absurd not to um so I am comfortable with it, with that, including in our um, jurisdiction and our recommendations. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that the committee sort of agrees with that before we kind of wade into a slightly different area uh, of concern. Senator Skinner, did you want to comment on that? Um, I, I mean, I think your point's important for us to weigh because we are, that our role, as you described, is to evaluate the penal code and with the objective of improving public safety and, and uh, looking at it in what, in what ways have our existing penal code not assisted us in that regard. But to um, Professor um, Ocean's points, I, I think it would be, I would be interested in how exactly you connect it to the, the objective as you described, and I'm not exactly sure, but I think just a section on uh, our women, our incarcerated women, yeah. would be a very valuable for a number of reasons. Um, one, we uh, there seems to be a good deal of evidence that our women are that the staff on uh, incarcerated individual assault is much higher in our women's facilities. It's not absent in our men's, but it's quite high in our women's facilities. And, you know, maybe there's a, an aspect of the penal code in terms of the, what is the, it would appear that there's, um, th that the women not appear, it's pretty obvious that they don't feel comfortable reporting. So there's then not consequence to the, uh, the staff or contractors who are engaged in that. So, and that of course is their, in my, you know, they're breaking the law and yet, we're not having any consequence, or I shouldn't say not having any, there's minimal consequence to their breaking the law. But additionally, in terms of women in prison, um, the long sentences for women 
have a disproportionate impact than on men. And specifically because women's reproductive years are only are very specific. So if a woman is sentenced for a long period of time, in effect, she is prevented from having children. And uh, I don't know if we've ever, as a, as a state or society, weighed that, that we are making such a decision. Um, so if you are incarcerated during your full childbearing years, we're in effect preventing you from having a child, whereas that is not does not have the same kind of consequence, but mostly on most men. Um, uh, and then, of course, there's the impact of separating women from their children. There is a lot of separating any parents from fam from children. We do see a correlated uh, uh, data on the children more likely ha having encounters with the criminal justice system. But you know, is there more? then if is it disproportionate where if the mother is removed from the child that the child is more likely going to end up in our uh, criminal justice system and should that be a factor in such sentences so i think this issue of of the sentences around women and i know it's sensitive because legally we're you know we have to do it equitably but i think that if we think about it it's not equitable if those sentences are in effect, a sentence that removes a woman from being able to have a child. Justice Marino. Yeah, just <clears throat> just an observation. Uh, I agree with the uh, the topics that, that Tom uh, laid out. Uh, I mean, just the DUI kind of focus is enormous. I mean, it's so complicated and so fraught with with issues on all on all sides. I'm, I'm I agree with. And even though I won't be on the commission next year, uh, I think it's good. Those are, I think, uh, severable. Let me call it severable sure. types of topics that can be covered. But I also agree with what Mike said that, you know, and in part what Nancy said about, you know, we have to focus on the on the objective of of the commission, which deals with penal code uh, uh, revision. So I have some some question about taking on larger topics. I'm not necessarily opposed to those, but I question whether or not they fall within the purview of the commission. Finally, on on I, I really think the uh, the issue with respect to issues of of uh, confinement, you know, incarceration and all that that's a worthy topic. But I think that too can be div divided into different severable topics, you know, like solitary confinement, uh, conditions in the jails. Uh, uh, conditions concerning uh, women's incarceration. Uh, that could be like one whole year's worth. Uh, and, you know, I recall like over over 10 years ago, uh, I was on a foster care commission dealing with issues of uh, women who were incarcerated who had, who were pregnant or who had infants. And this was at the uh, Correctional Institution for Women in Chino. I'd be interested to in see what the results were of that program, but I don't know if the warden started it there, it was a result of some kind of legislation. But to me, it was a very worthy uh, effort to really not tear apart families, particularly where young infants uh, are involved. So I think just that topic alone would be worthy of saying if there's some kind of uh, a method, whether it's through the penal code or, or some other uh, reform, that would really expand on that. But I guess my, my point is that with respect to conditions of confinement, A, is that within the purview of our of the commission? And, and second, it, it, it encompasses so many uh, disparate issues that it might be worthy of just one report for the year, focusing on those separate uh, components. I think one, one issue uh, might be that we take on, or we have taken on too many issues in a particular year without an overriding theme. And that just might be something for the the commission to think about. Um, I, here's my position. Um, so this is in some ways colored by, I've for the past few months been, I was appointed to um, be part of the San Quentin Transformation Advisory Council. Um, I think this critical part 
of criminal law in California to pay attention to what happens to people who are punished under it. And to ignore it, I think, is, you know, a little bit putting your head underneath the sand. Um, so I think it is within the scope of this um, committee, if we if we want. Um, I do also agree with Justice Moreno that it could absorb all of our time, which I would oppose. Um, what we've done a good job on, I think, or particularly staff, is taken sort of an idea, a broad idea, gone out and researched areas that are the biggest problems and areas of concern in California and identified potential solutions in sort of compartmentalized ways that are digestible and actually can get to results. So rather than committing a whole year setting conditions of confinement, um, I think that we should consider not as our first meeting, certainly, but sort of down the road next year, thinking about all of these issues that I'm going to generally sort of put under the umbrella as what happens to people once they've been, um, you know, convicted. So it seems like that there's interest amongst the members um, figuring out the ways where we could be most um, effective, I think still is, you know, to be decided and something that we'll tackle down the road. Yeah, I think just, just finally, in the topics that uh, Tom set out, I could think of a penal code section or an issue, uh, a specific issue of reform, you know, whether it's accomplice liability, DUI, factual innocence comes up quite a bit, but it's kind of vague. And I think judges could use more and lawyers could use more more guidance. Uh, so I think there's an associated penal code section with each of those. The others, again, it's it's not for me to say whether that's within the purview, but it's a broader topic. Let me just put it that way. And um, just on, on the point about the scope of the Penal Code Revisions Committee's uh, charge, I, I understand those concerns, but I, I'm certain that there are areas um, with regard to conditions in women where our charge overlaps. Um, mm -hmm. The other point is, you know, I think if we're, you know, where the areas where we certainly do have um, authority is in the context of arrests, for example, arrests of, of women have increased quite significantly. And so I think it'd be interesting to look at those areas where perhaps there has been an increase in, in women's arrests um, and, and try to see, are there areas where we can, are, are there particularly things that are, that are driving or triggering um, those increases that, that we should be mindful of? So I think by look, having a gendered lens, we might be able to see areas where we might not have, you know, pay particular attention. So part of what I'm encouraging generally is a gendered lens for the work that we're doing right. um, and to have a specific um, look at certain areas where we know that um, women and fem you know, feminine people or gender expansive people um, are being disparately impacted. Right. I, I, certainly, I, saw that. I certainly saw that with respect to uh, accomplice liability for women. It's an accessory after the fact, the harboring a felon, et cetera, uh, or a fugitive. Uh, so, yeah, I'm sure there are many, many examples where they get tied in uh, kind of as an accessory to, to a crime. So um, let me try to wrap this up. So first of all, um, I agree with the, the focus on gender, and I think that there, we have a lot of data that we can bring to this. I think there's, you know, some of this is driven by anecdote and let's let's get the real data. Let's find out where the disparate impact is. Let's understand the ideas of accomplice liability. We certainly hear about those stories all the time, but we can get some real data on that. And I think um, and I think it's, you know, an appropriate and good way of thinking about the, the law in general. Um, with regard to our the scope of our committee, I think we're well within it. Um, just reading from the um, enabling statute, it says that we're supposed to address the substance of criminal law in California. I think that that gets there. Um, criminal procedure, alternatives to incarceration, improve parole and probation, um, address protection of public safety, the severity of defense, rates of recidivism, available and success of alternatives to incarceration, and empirical disparities between different populations. I think that that fits within everything that we've been discussing right now. Um, so um, it seems like that there's some consensus, at least beginning of the year, with the topics that um, Tom flagged for us 
and then maybe later in the year trying to address some of these issues that I'm going to broadly call conditions with, a, especially with a gendered lens. That were remote landing. All right. Obviously, at any point, whether in committee meeting or just on the side, please let us know, me, Tom, Joy, Rick, anybody, if there are particular issues that come to your attention say, hey, I think this would be inappropriate for committee study. We are not in any way locked into anything. We're just trying to, to um, give committee staff um, some direction for the first couple of meetings so they can get rolling. Um, you know, and so we could hit the ground running in the new in the new year. Um, I do not need to mean to shut this conversation at all. All right, good. Um, with that said, I'm going to shut the conversation uh, and move on to public comment. Uh, before we vote on the draft report, we will have public comment. My, Mike, the, before we do that, can I do 30 seconds on crime statistics? Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, no, no it's, it's do, all do good. more. I, I I forgot that we were doing that. Yeah, more than thirty seconds would be appreciated. Well, that's that's about how long it'll take, I think. So, right. um, you know, we we've seen this this uh, table before. Basically, what we're able to do is the largest cities and California police departments report uh, data to an advocacy group called the Major City Chiefs Association. They put out a report, you know, quarterly about violent crime in the biggest cities across the country, including the ones in California. So we're able to track from quarter to quarter what's happening compared to what was happening at the time last year. Uh, so we're able to go through September now. And what we see is violent crime is still less than it was last year. It's about 3% less than the in the California cities. That's what this um, column here is. If we look at cities outside of California, it's a little bit bigger, but you know, pretty close, 3.9 versus 3.2, you know, uh, not much bigger. If you look at just the cities that are in LA, which are Long Beach, um, LAPD and the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, we see a, you know a, about a 4% decline. Big drops in homicides, 16% bigger in California than outside of California, a double digit drop in, in rape, which is bigger than outside of California, and then smaller drops in robbery and aggravated assault. So I think this is good news. Um, and uh, you know we'll continue to report on this and um, that's sort of where we are. And the last thing I'll say is particularly on the LA situation is, as I'm sure you all know, on October 1st, a new uh, bail schedule went into effect for folks um, arrested before they were arraigned that um, eliminated money bail for a lot of offenses. Um, and even you know, with that going into effect, we're still seeing uh, drops in violent crime and I believe property crime as well. Um, and we're hoping to take a closer look at that with the California Policy Lab early next year, just to do a quick evaluation of the impact on public safety of that policy. And of course, the court is putting out their own data, which uh, looks very promising as well. So that's where we are. Tom, I, I can't tell you how much. Oh, keep that up for a second, Tom. Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> no, I, I just can't tell you how refreshing that presentation is and how infuriating it is at the same time, uh, given the kind of reigning narratives uh, around the issues where data has kind of lost its its proper footing as the the barometer of how well things are going and what we're doing. Um, thank you for for the work on this. And I, I love the January to September cuts so that you can get a great look at what happens with the bail schedule change. I know there's a lot of eyes on that in Los Angeles. And I think the courts are really kind of leading in a in a way that they haven't uh, in in any time that I know of around this issue, and it's it's refreshing to see. So thank you for sharing that with us. I, I, I want to add that this is, yes, Justice Moreno. Yeah, and I think a lot of that credit goes to the uh, presiding judge, Samantha Jessner, who uh, really gave a kind of a resounding uh, introduction to the changes in the, in, in the bail uh, schedule. So that's gone public. But it still is distressing, Tom, that uh, the figures in Long Beach and Oakland are just out of the ballpark. So uh, it's not all hunky-dory. That's uh, right. And part of it is, uh, you know, some of these minor, so-called minor crimes like auto burglary and petty theft and these uh, smash and grab and stuff, those get such enormous publicity, right? And and the, that, that really fuels the public perception that, that crime crime is up. Uh, so these statistics uh, belie that with respect to these very serious uh, crimes, but it, it's hard to counter 
public perception when you see these things on TV and things are just totally out of control. So I think that really explains why people still think that crime is up when it really isn't. Well, and, and I, two quick reactions I think you all might be interested in that is the, the car theft um, phenomenon really seems to be driven by two models of car, Kias and Hyundais, had a exploit yeah. that was publicized on social media. Usually I'd be quite skeptical that that'd be an excl explanation. But if you actually look at the models of cars that saw more car thefts, it was those two in the, in the places that have that uh, kind of data. Yeah. Um, and on the sort of the shoplifting front, um, you know, LAPD in particular has made, I think, something like 80% more arrests for larceny this year than they did last year. So they certainly, it appears, have the tools um, under existing law without having to change things like Prop 47 to um, arrest people for a lot of those offenses. Whether that will translate to a decrease in, in the rate, I think um, we'll have to see. But I was struck by um, how many more people are being arrested for larceny and uh, by the LAPD this year. Oh, and the last thing, just for those in the audience, what Justice Marino is referring to of Oakland and Long Beach is there's a, a, a staff memo that has city by city um, statistics like this that aren't on this chart. So if folks are interested in that, you can refer to that for um, yeah. a little more information. Yeah, just Spinoza. Yeah, just on the subject of the changes to the bail schedule in Los Angeles County, for the first time in as long as I can remember, the daily census at the LA County Jail is approaching or below the BSCC uh, rating for uh, safe incarceration in the LA County Jail. So that's good news. Yeah, this is this is a, because of the number, the short stay issue. This is another um, uh, offshoot of that. Um, the effects of the zero bail should be felt pretty quickly um, in the jails. Um, I, I just want to highlight while this is up um, that this is data that's almost current. It's up to September of this year. Um, the state publishes its crime rate data almost a year late, the Attorney General's office. This is something that, you know, I think that we can be part of and trying to help. Um, and, and I think it, it, part of the result, Assemblymember Brian, is that the public, you know, um, has to rely on you know, news media and anecdote rather than than real data, and the state is slow in reporting hard data. So um, this is part of an effort that has been guard in large part behind the scenes with staff and I to really ramp up our data um, availability. It's something that we've worked with with the governor's office and is certainly open to all legislators if they have particular questions about what's going on on crime rates or prison rates or jail rates or recidivism rates um, in the state or in their particular county or with regard to specific offenses. Um, I think we're taking big strides in our data um, use and analysis presentation. And I think we're gonna take some big strides in that um, in the coming year with the help of CPL and, and some other folks. Uh, Tom, is there anything you wanna add to that? But this is this is critical. And again, like I want to emphasize that this is, you know, as current as it gets, and it, it is not statewide data, it, it's focused on the large cities, but it tracks, we've been able to go back in years past, and it tracks with what ends up being the full statewide data once that becomes published, basically a year from now. Tom? No, that's right. Yeah. All right. Okay, any, thank you. Any thoughts or questions about this? I think we'll have some really, I do, and just on the data front generally, I think we're going to have some exciting announcements and developments in the coming year um, with our data um, capabilities. Um, this is only part of it. All right. We've come to public comment. Before we uh, formally vote on the draft report, we're going to have hear from um, our listeners and watchers. Uh, to get in line to comment, please select the raise hand function on Zoom. If you're calling in, please hit star nine. Note that this meeting is being recorded and that if you make a public comment, your name and or phone number may be displayed as part of the recording. If you'd like to comment, please select the raise hand function now. We'll take a minute to see how many people want to comment. Based on that, we'll see how long each person has to comment. Please note that the committee also accepts public comment in writing. 
That comment can be emailed to committee staff whose emails are in the committee webpage. In many ways, this is the better and more substantive way to get your comments before the committee. As a reminder, we'll be voting on the committee report after pu hearing public comment in case anything arises that may influence our decisions. With that said, Got three people with hands up. Should we get started? And sure. Um, let's take 90 seconds each. Um, Jane Corrant, you're first. Uh, thank you, committee. I, I just want to um again compliment you on all the hard work you're doing. Um, the recommendations are terrific. I complete I could particularly want to uplift uh four. And five, I think uh, the resentencing and the question of the long sentences um, are ones that, you know, year after year, um, uh, we are concerned about and would like to see obvious changes. Very disappointing that we couldn't even get SB 94 through, um, but uh, to get that um, discretion back to the uh, judges. Um, and out of the hands of uh, prosecutors, um, I think was one of the things that um, Senator Cortese was attempting to do um, in rewriting that from SB 300 the year before. Um, I also want to point out that this is the second year um, that I have heard Senator Skinner recommend that one of the topics be the women's prisons. Um, I work with the California Coalition of Women Prisoners, and I'm also very grateful to see the emphasis on uh, accomplice because we know, and um, I know personally, um, women serving life without parole, I correspond with um, such people. And um, in almost every instance, there was actually you know, uh, there was a force and and even rape um, that uh, that these were not uh, these were not voluntary actions. Um, being in the car, being an accomplice, all of the rest of it. So uh, I'm I really appreciate that, and I really appreciate the discussion of uh, conditions of confinement. Um, I want to also uplift um, Senator Skinner's work on sexual abuse um, and what what's, uh, we know um, firsthand, what goes on. Uh, we visit both CIW and CCWF. And, I'm sorry. And have private conversations. So I just, I hope that this year um, there will be a strong emphasis. I'm thrilled to see Professor Ocean back. And again, I want to thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Crispy? Good morning. Um, I'm Crispy, survivor of harm. Um, recommendation number five, expand second look resentencing, will go a long way towards this committee's goal of making recommendations that would simplify and rationalize the law and procedures while improving equity and public safety. It would effectively end the LWAP sentence and would bring the California model for prisons more substantially in tune with the Scandinavian model and the U recent UN recommendation to end LWAP and death by incarceration sentences in the United States. I urge you to ensure that there are no exclusions and that it be retroactive so that all people in California state prisons serving long sentences get a second look after 15 years, after serving 15 years and please include an implementation plan in the bill. Board transparency and improvements to the board of parole hearings would also be necessary as the grant rate is very low. So thank you to the committee, the staff, the panelists and researchers for all of your hard work. And I'd like to read just one of the several statements from people who are incarcerated that I've sent ahead in email. This is from Eric Phillips from San Quentin Rehabilitation Center. The second look resentencing would be a godsend, especially for people like me, as I've already served 29 and a half years, have an exemplary post-conviction record, no regular write-ups, yet the board just gave me a three-year denial by the board for a writ to waive restitution under Penal Code 1465.9, my third parole denial. This idea promotes a more realistic look at rehabilitative changes in individuals and not arbitrary subjective decisions. Thank you, and I appreciate the work that you do. Thank, thank, thank you, Crispy. Um, and and I just want to say that you know you're all uh, regular listeners. Um, 
or Zoom watchers. Um, I, I'm, I'm particularly proud this past year that the governor signed AB um, 300, 300, 600, which one is it, Tom? 600. 600, Maybe 600. Yeah. yeah, 600, which will give a lot of opportunities for a lot of uh, resentencing, uh, particular for you know targeting people um, who sent where the sentencing law has changed since their incarceration, which affects a lot of people. It, it obviously has some exclusions, but it really does um, advance the idea that people should be sentenced uh, under or serving sentences that are consistent with current law, um, and will hopefully help help a lot of people. Um, finally, uh, Marion Wickard. Good morning, everyone. Hey, um, I would like to share, not at this time, about being a system impacted when my husband got his sentence. So I definitely love that you're going to reach out to people who have someone that's incarcerated and talk to them and see how their sentences affect families. Senator Skinner, your certificate for the men in prison to employment meant more than you could ever imagine. I have Tommy's and yeah, it meant a lot. So thank you for reaching out to the men like that. And I would ask you to, as the panel looks into things, to have second strikers treated like second strikers, not like third strikers, because Tommy is not able to go to the elderly parole board meeting until he, in 2030, because he is a second striker being treated like a third striker. I don't have a lot to say today. I just really wanted to thank Senator Skinner. That certificate is priceless. And thank you all for everything you're doing. That's it. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank, thank you all. Um, I'll close our public comment period. I see no other hands raised. Um, we've come to the point of our deliberations to approve the 2024 annual report. I'm not going to rehash the 10 recommendations at this time, but instead ask if there are any additions, modifications, or suggestions that committee members would like to make to the report, aside from what we discussed earlier. Oops. I cut myself off. Um, anyhow, are there any additional recommendations aside from what we uh, discussed earlier? With Senator Skinner, you're on mute. Sorry, I'll move the report with the uh, modifications or additions that we discussed earlier. Great. Subject to that discussion earlier, including the prerogative that I have to make non-substantive changes, can we have a second to approve uh, Senator Skinner's um, motion? Second by Priscilla Ochen. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any any opposed? Congratulations, anyone, everyone. Uh, this is another year of um, incredible hard work. And now that we've approved um, the report, we plan to have it out by mid-December. At our next meeting, hopefully in February, staff will be in touch. Um, this is our uh, last time meeting together for the year. Um, but before we close, and in the spirit of the holiday week, I just want to express my deepest appreciation to you all, um, and especially to Tom, Rick, and Joy. Um, we couldn't do it without you guys. This report is reflects in a tremendous amount of work. To Justice Moreno, we will miss you. Thank you. Um, we've accomplished a lot together. I look forward to working together next year. Uh, thank you all for your work, effort, and your commitment to the committee's work. Have a great holiday, and uh, we'll be in touch. Meetings adjourned. Thank you, staff. Thank you.